That was a band called Fun. We just watched a video called Carry On. And uh, for those who are watching on Memorex, I should say, on the video, uh, we just had the opportunity to preview that. I hope that you will do that. It is truly a, a powerful, uplifting message of carrying on, and it's appropriate for a lesson for today from the Gospel of John, the 15th chapter, because we are instilled with some incredible things to help us carry on through the difficult challenges of life, and that's what today's lesson is really about. But it's also an appropriate lesson because today is Mother's Day, right? Mother's Day, uh, isn't it great and we've had the opportunity to celebrate our mothers. I know many of you maybe didn't have great mothers, maybe you have, have uh, beef with your mother. Many mothers, many of you have had a wonderful relationship with your mothers. Maybe they're living, maybe they're no longer here with us. But the one thing about a good mother, a good mother always puts a little bit of themselves in everything they do, don't they? So a little bit of their love that just makes it a little bit different and it reminds you of how uh, important of what, what a wonderful influence they've been on our lives. And so it reminds me of a story. A young boy in Sunday school was asked by a Sunday school teacher, well, do you folks pray every night before you eat your meals? And the boy said, no. And the, and the Sunday school teacher said, well, why not? That seems crazy. You should pray before you eat. And the boy said, well, we don't need to pray in our household. He said, why? Because my mom makes good food. <laughs> All right, that's pretty good, huh, John? But why do people that's actually, right. actually never actually pray? Right, well, you know, some people don't always pray uh, before they eat their meals because, again, the moms make good food. But in this case, uh, we're really grateful. That prayer just shows us that we're grateful and sober. Today, I want to deal with that theme. One of the things, maybe your mom makes some great food, and she always put a little bit of her love in that, didn't she? So you could have somebody else make the exact same recipe, and it just doesn't taste the same. Because it's not made by your mom. What's the secret ingredient again? It's her love for you that made it special. I'm sure an objective person will probably taste the food by one person, by your mom, and somebody else who makes the exact same recipe and tastes the same, but to you it doesn't. And you know the difference because that love is indeed there. And today's lesson is all about how we can carry on through the challenging things that we are going to face in life because of what God has placed in you. You are God's special recipe, all right? And God has chosen you and put some awesome things inside of you that set you apart and make you amazing. And so when we look at our lesson for today, God, I think as I listen, I, I put five different things that I got, I think God has done and put inside of you when he was baking you up and making you in the kingdom of heaven. And this is really cool. And so I want you to keep this stuff near and dear to your hearts today. When God chose you, God chose you for a purpose. God chose you to be a person of joy and place joy in your hearts. Now, I don't know about you, have you ever known these real dour Christians who walk around, it's like everything is such a struggle, and they don't, it's like they don't want you to be happy. Because, well, we shouldn't be happy. We need to obey God's will, after all. Or they let you know how you're not right with God, and how you need to get this right with God, and that right with God, and they just suck the life out of a room. Don't you hate that? But that's not God's will for you. God wants you to breathe life of joy into every room you go into. But I need you to understand something. Notice that the Bible does not use the phrase happiness. I'm telling you parents, the worst thing in the world that you can wish for your kids for the rest of their life is that they be happy. I just want them to be happy. That's a bad wish for your kids. You don't know why? Because happiness is fleeting. It comes and goes, and it's based on the happenstances or the circumstances of life. And the happenstances of life are not always good. And so if you're training them in life and you just want them to be happy, and things aren't happy at that moment, they're going to be struggling with a very difficult challenge. They need to carry on, so to speak, as our song was teaching us. The happenstances are bad, and they're unhappy. How are they going to survive in life, if that's what you've been teaching them? that your only wish for them is to be happy. So this is what we should really wish for them, that they have a life filled with joy. Because joy is not dependent upon the circumstances of life. You can be joyful despite those circumstances. 
Again, not based on the happenstance of life, but ultimately the relationship that we have with God. I want to tell you a story, a true story of a family that has been through the mill in our congregation. I mean, a terrible, terrible time. This was like 15 years ago. They have been through every calamity and tragedy that you could possibly imagine going on in their life. And you wonder how in the world this couple could survive this, and then uh, along with their kids. And you just say, God, even for them, my prayer for them was, God, how can you do this? I mean, at least give this, this family a break. And some people would probably go through the type of challenges that they do would just kind of give up on God. But one day, I'll never forget, they came to visit me at the office, and they sat down and they said, I was really afraid what we're going to talk about. They said, we came by because we are so grateful for everything that God has done for us in life. And could, right now, my jaw is dropping off the floor. And then they hand me a check. They said, we've been saving for the last five years to go to Florida, and we decided as a family, we're so grateful for everything that God has done that we want to give our vacation money as a gift to God to the church. And I took this check, and it was a significant check, okay? I look at this thing, and I'm just like, my jaw's dropping again. I take the check, I hand it back to them, and I said, I can't accept this check. And you know what that woman did to me? She slapped me on the hand. That's what she did. She said, how dare you? I'm like, what? She said, how dare you try to steal my joy? Okay. He said, this is my gift because of my gratitude for everything that God has done. And I was thinking all about the tragedies that took over them in their life, but they weren't overtaken by the tragedies. They had joy, the joy of God in their life. So no matter how tragic life seemed to be from the outside, their lives were filled with joy. That's what God wants for us. Going on. The second thing that God wants to put inside of our hearts, the second thing that he wants to touch us with, is love. Again, that's in verse 12 to 13 in our lesson for today. Now he says, that I want your life to be filled with love, and I want you to love others, and because I know what it means to love. Christ's demand for love, in this case, is based upon the gift that he gave of himself on a cross for us 2,000 years ago. He gave himself for us. And I will tell you, sometimes some people, like myself included, we said, well, if God gave his life for us through Jesus Christ, then I have to live my life in the same way. I've got to give everything away for everybody else. And I'm telling you, that's not what Jesus means. We don't need another martyr. We don't need another person hanging on the cross. You do not have to give everything in your life away to everybody else. Okay? Jesus, in the giving of his life, was a done once and for all, for all eternity, for everybody. It is not demanded of you that you give your life up for everybody else. Now, if somebody were to come and try to attack my daughter and my wife, I would probably give my life to protect them. Not probably, I would. Yeah, I had somebody give me an eyeball. You probably would? No, I would, okay? And I guarantee you they would do the same for me. Now the rest of you, you're on your own, okay? That's between you and your families. I will probably not come out of the way and stand in front of a bullet for you. I just, I'm not trying to be selfish, but I'm not sure that's what God is calling me to do. Okay? That's right. That's right. Well, we'll love you. We'll love you anyway, but well, I don't know about that. But showing the love, what love he had for us by giving him uh, his life for us gives him the right to demand that we give our lives or love other people. But again, I don't think it necessarily means that we have to give up our lives for other people. But the one thing I do learn from this lesson is that love is not just a squishy, ushy feeling in the pit of your stomach. Remember what I tell our couples when they get married? Love isn't that squishy feeling. You just got married. I did your wedding. And what did I say? Love is not a squishy feeling. That's gas. It passes. Okay? Love is something that no matter how you feel, you are committed to it. Because love is a verb. Okay? Love is demonstrated by our actions, not our feelings. Feelings come and go. It's kind of like the happiness in life. Happiness comes and goes. 
If we're basing our life on being happy, it comes and goes. If we're basing our life on the feelings we have about love, those feelings come and go. It's the commitment that we make that lasts forever. The commitment that God makes to us. Look at the next page. So God has placed his joy in our hearts. He wants to place joy in our hearts. God wants to place love in our hearts. God wants to be our friend. I want you to imagine what a profound thing that is, and I'm going to highlight for you how profound this is. We are no longer slaves, Jesus says in verse 14 to 15. We are friends of God. Now, the word slave itself was a phrase, the slave of God was used of a guy named Moses, Joshua, David, three of the biggest characters in the Old Testament, and all three of them were called the slaves of God and were honored to be so. Paul and James, apostles of Jesus, considered it an honor to be called a slave of God. But what is a slave? A slave is a person who is a living tool. God doesn't consider you a tool. God doesn't consider you a hammer. God doesn't consider you a rake, okay, or a shovel. You know what God sees you as? As a friend. And so the word friend in the Old Testament, friend of God, was only used of one person. Does anybody know who that one person in the Old Testament was called the friend of God? You know who that was? Abraham. You got it! Abraham! Abraham was the only person in the entire Old Testament who was called the friend of God. It was an exclusive title only for him. But now in the New Testament, because of what Jesus has done, friend is now a title that is given to us. I want you to understand the impact of that. That phrase, friend of God, or friend of the Lord, friend of the Master, was a title that was only given to the most intimate of confidants of a king. You are the friend of a king. You are the most intimate confidant of a king. And that title is given to everyone who believes in him. And so we've received a promotion that Moses didn't receive. Moses, slave of God. David, friend of the king. And I can say that for every single one of you. You are, each one of you, friend of the king. So what does that mean? When you're friend of the king, that means the king shares his agenda with you. How cool is that? Not only does the king share his agenda with you, you are a partner now with Jesus. You have the opportunity to communicate directly with God and to contribute creatively to God's work in the world. Think about how amazing that is. You have a choice how you are going to represent God in this world. Because God has given you amazing abilities and amazing gifts and says, now just go out and make something up. You know, it's not a rule or regulation. You've got to do this, you've got to do that, you've got to do that. I got it. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you got, it, it's not about rules and regulations. That's those, again, the people who steal the joy out of your life and want to tell you how to live and how you got to go and live your life and how you need to live in order to be faithful to God. Anybody who tells you how you got to live your life to be faithful to God is not a messenger of God. Because that's between you and God. You are a friend and a confidant of God. And you're going to discover for yourself how God has called you to live and do some amazing creative things to be an amazing person and a blessing in this world. That is awesome. And each of you are unique. And so go and use your blessings. Uh, I can tell you that I, I just, I'm just pointing out a few things. Janice, you, I, you do a lot of crocheting. You introduced my daughter to some of that crocheting. And I don't know whether it was an intentional thing or thinking, oh, I'm doing this in God's name. But you are doing it in God's name. Because it's something you love to do, and you're introducing her, and you share that with her. My daughter, she draws things for people. She does a lot of things. She cares for animals. I think that's an incredible thing. And so I look around here, and each one of you have a unique blend of gifts that you can use, that you can use uh, because you're a friend of God. And you're just going to go and be creative in this world. I think that's awesome. Number four. So God has placed in your heart joy, love, he calls you a friend. He now calls you an advertisement, an ambassador, a walking billboard who proclaims Jesus. So you got, you know, all across you, you know, maybe you can't, maybe it's not the written words, but all across you is basically this is an, you are, that you are an ambassador of God. And people see Jesus in you. Or don't. 
Hopefully they do. And I believe that they do. Because I see the love of God in every single one of you. You are a walking billboard who proclaims Jesus. Now, in, in, in politics, how does a person get an ambassadorship? Oh, by lobbying and supporting the person who becomes president and giving lots of money. If you don't give lots of money, you don't become an ambassador. But the cool thing about the ambassadorship that God has called you to, it's not about the money you give. It's not about the things you've done. It's just because God thinks you're a great and cool person and says, oh, I'm going to make you my ambassador. You don't have to have done anything. God just believes in you that much. God believes in you that much that God appoints you to be an ambassador of God. So when we're an ambassador of God, you're not called to argue with people or threaten people in order to make them believe. You know, how many times have we seen that in the news recently? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, we've got, of course, now I want to make sure we're clear with this. I want to communicate this clearly. We have some, certainly we're all thinking right now, some radical uh, Muslims who have done that who want to enforce their will upon us. There are some radical Christians. Now, the one thing about the radical Christians, they're not going and killing people. I will confess that's true. But there are some radical Christians like our, uh, the people at Westboro Baptist Church, for instance, who want to enforce their will upon you and make you believe the way they believe or else you're going to hell. Okay? Remember, you're a friend of God. You don't need Westboro Baptist Church to tell you how to believe and where to get off and how you should live your life. Because you're a friend and a confidant of God, you will develop your own relationship with God. Don't let anybody else try to tell you how to get off and do it. Okay? But that does mean that we have a job to do. We're not people of leisure. We're representatives, ambassadors of God. And we are to live our lives in a manner that's a reflection of the love, the trust that God has placed in us as his confidants. And then number five. So God gives us what love, peace, calls us his friends, makes us his ambassadors. But then he does something really cool. He gives us a family. We are the family of God. And as family members, we can ask each other for anything, and we can ask God for anything. Isn't that true with our parents? Now, some of the requests that we ask of our parents are silly. We go up to our parents. Uh, actually, I went to my daughter. My daughter's asking me about Father's Day, what I want. And so I pulled out an advertisement in a magazine. It was a P51 Mustang. It was only $2.5 million. She kind of looked at me and said, well, I don't think I have that kind of money. That's not going to happen, okay? So yes, you can go and ask your parents or your daughters for anything, but that doesn't mean they have the ability, or maybe it's not a wise thing to give you. Especially the way I see right now, I think giving me a P-51 Mustang would be a death trap, right? Yes. It would be a bad gift. That so, would, that not, I love not, you, Dad. I know, you would be. I love you, Dad. Now go and die in a P-51 Mustang. No. Um, the giving that God wants to give to us is predicated in us knowing the heart of God and knowing what is in our what, what God has that God has our best interests in mind. Okay? So I want to leave you with this. God has chosen you. God has placed his love, his joy. God has called inside of you. God has, has, has called you his friend. God has made you an ambassador because you are a close confidant of God. God has given you a family which you can ask anything because you should be so comfortable with uh, your relationship with God that you know that God is never going to blow you off. And I want to make sure that you understand, leave this place understanding that you are the chosen person of God and how important and precious you are to him. And so I'm going to invite you in prayer today to bow your heads and let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we have been chosen by God. We thank you that uh, you place your love inside of us, your peace inside of us. Now, your love and your peace is so much better than any squishy feeling and certainly so much better uh, than a happiness in life. You don't wish us happiness. You wish us joy amidst the journeys and the challenges of life. And so we pray that you would walk with us and lift us up. We pray that you would help us as we are your confidant, that you would help us to develop an intimate relationship with you so that we might better represent you as your ambassadors and we might take your love to places where it is unknown so that we might make those who've been estranged from God, family of God. 
And we just pray that all this world would be blessed with that relationship. And we give thanks for all these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And so I'm, my, my prayer for you this day is may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord upon your favor give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord,